morning again, everybody. It's uh, my great pleasure to be here. First, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to uh, share with you some of our research and thought uh, in our uh, recent development. So the title is something very complicated. I'm not going to repeat. And the outline of uh, talk uh, today would, would be green super rice to green agriculture. And also I will present to you some new models for rice production and the future of rice in China, my personal perspective. And um, so the first is green super rice leading to green agriculture. So we all talk about food security uh, from yesterday, today, and in all, the, in all the presentations. And in my view, we are actually addressing two things. One is the total demands. And we have been talking about 9 billion people by 2050. And we are also, another very important point is sustainability of the production. So we have been discussing about these sort of problems for very long. At the turning of the century in China, we have been discussing identifying the problems in Chinese uh, agricultural production. So we arrange the uh, sort of problems, something like this. We have damages by pests and diseases, and in this indiscriminate applications of pesticide, we have pressures for high yield, but we have overuse of chemical fertilizers. We have water shortage, we have drought, and need improvement of grain quality and uh, product quality. And yield have been stagnating for quite a few years, and also we need uh, to increase the yield potential. So, for example, and uh, the data we got in 2005, and we could see the problems, uh, the uh, damages by pests and insecticide uh, and pests and diseases. We can see here the number one pest is uh, in rice, which is called plant hoppers. The number two insect and uh, damages or leaf folders again in rice. Number three is uh, stri uh, stripe step folders and also in rice. And number four, she's blind. So we talk about the problems of uh, insect and pest uh, diseases, but we, we are talking about rice problems. So what should we do? And the question is, how much can we harvest without pesticide? A large scale comparative experiment by prote plant protection station of Hubei province showed that rice could only yield 20% without pesticide application. That was a data obtained in 2005. So uh, actually we had uh, some sort of a statistic saying, as we always say, with 8% uh, of arable land in China, we're supporting 22% of the world population, but we're using 35, over 35% of pesticide and fertilizer globally. So we are calling for second green revolution. So at the turning of the century, we have been defining what we should do for, no, for new innovation and new evolution, uh, new revolution. We call it second green revolution. We have 10 Chinese characters, which is less input, more production for better environment. So in this context, we propose a notion called green super rice. The goal is to greatly reduce the use of pesticide, fertilizers, and irrigation on the premise of continuous improvement of yield and quality. And gradually, we define that the goal of green super rice as less pesticide, less fertilizer, and water saving and drought resistance, high yield, and uh, superior quality. And uh, the way to do it is to have all the great trade, all the good trade together. We have insect resistance, we should have disease resistance, we should have nutrient use efficiency, we should have yield, we should have quality, and all put into one single variety called green super rice. And we actually initiated a green, rice, a green super rice development project in China supported by most, the Ministry of Science and Technology uh, under the National A63 project. So that was the first phase initiated in 2010 in Wuhan. And then uh, uh, we had a second phase started in uh, 2014 
and with uh, uh, 27 groups from five rice growing regions in China, from northeast all the way to southwest. Now our girls uh, probably a little bit long term cultivars that allow re reduction of 30% of pesticide fertilizers and irrigation. At the same time, achieving high yield and superior quality. So, basic strategy for the development of green super rice is we should have germplasm, of course, and then uh, this should be combined with uh, something we call the genomic science and technology. Actually, that including all the scientific research, genetics, uh, plant physiology, and uh, all the other things. We call it genomic science and technology and breeding. So it's an integration of science, technology, germplasm into breeding. And then that is some sort of outlines we have uh, uh, in our functional genomics project. We have germplasm uh, diversity with germplasm identification. We uh, should construct the platforms, resource platform and techno technological platforms. All those omics uh, together, identifying genes and regulatory elements and regulatory network and characterize uh, the, the, the functions and the, the, the control of uh, molecularly, uh, molecular character, characterization of the functional genes and put all this together into our genomic breeding programs, a new norm. So at the very end, we aim at, uh, to uh, understand the function of the genome. So uh, as of now, actually, the number we uh, we calculated by the end of uh, last year. So the total community over the years has characterized a total of close to 3,000 functional genes. The genes could be uh, divided into categories like yield, green quality, and disease resistance, insect resistance, stress resistance, and nutrient use efficiency, etc. So uh, the number is not very big, but it's, it's big enough to do some work. So we define our long-term goals for rice functional genomic research, a project called Rice 2020. We are very close to, 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 uh, to the year of 2020. So look at the second. Uh, second goal is to assignment of biological functions to every annotated genes. And how many genes we still don't know. Uh, but my estimate would be 50,000. But as of now, we, we are not uh, even even characterize 3,000 genes yet. So we are very far away, but still uh, we, are, we are moving. So, and also whatever we have done, so we have seven goals, whatever we, we have done, we, we would try to uh, use uh, uh, the knowledge, the gene resources and technologies in our breeding programs to develop high throughput knowledge-based rice breeding. So a little bit touch of uh, genomic breeding, which is, should be considered as application of functional genomics in uh, functional genomics in rice breeding. And we developed some sort of concept of whole genome selection. It's based on technologies for high throughput detection of DNA polymorphisms. And we're making make maximum use of information about genetics, function, and the phenotypes of the genes. It's a simultaneous selection for the target a non-target and the background, and ac according to the goals of breeding programs, and this sort of uh, process would revolutionize selections by improving precision and efficiency. And we developed several versions of uh, breeding chips. The first one is a Red 6 k It's a collaboration between company and universities, and that is uh, the 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 uh, uh, a chip with six thousand uh, features. In, the, in it, so that is used for field breeding. And then later on, we incorporated the information from functional genes to have a second version, right SNP 50. Actually, we aimed at a, a resolution with 60,000 features. Again, it's a collaboration of university and the company. And then another um, a sort of component in this system is gene-specific selection systems. It's a target and the background, which you select for both. So the target gene, which is a red dot, and is what we want. And we want recombination between the target genes and the adjacent markers within the 
distance of 100 kb, that is 0.5 centimorgans or less. So the target gene should carry very little of the genetic background into, into the new background. So we put it together uh, a sort of a selection scheme with that sort of scheme from the very first generation to the very last product that needs only a total of 12 individuals in the field. So with one Chinese move, we could incorporate or integrate or integrate more than a thousand genes all together. So it doesn't need very much space to grow our rice plant in the field. That is a scheme. If anybody's interested, they could read our paper. And then use this sort of technologies, we are integrating uh, blast resistant genes because that could be a very big problem in certain rice uh, uh, producing area. So uh, we improve uh, cultivars by integrating blast resistant genes. Actually, we integrate the uh, uh, near, develop near isogenic lines, the same genetic background, carry only one individual gene. So, so far we have succeeded in PI1, PI2, PI9, PIGM, and also the uh, uh, fragrance gene, etc., to make a multi-line variety. So uh, that has been tested in large scale in Heinongjiang province, which is in the northeast China, uh, a very big rice group breeding uh, rice production area. This may provide an effective strategy for durable resistance. And then uh, back to the green, uh, green super rice project, uh, we have uh, released many varieties with, with green tray, and it has been in rice producing area uh, at, up to the end of last year of something like six mini hectares already accumulate, accumulate, accumulative uh, area. So uh, this is also we have also a collaboration project uh, with many people, with IRI and also uh, many uh, African countries and also Asian countries for develop uh, green, green super rice. And the, based on the development in rice, we are, have been proposing to our resource saving and environment friendly agriculture and uh, uh, with a book and uh, a consultative uh, report to the government. So we propose to risk uh, a mechanism for restriction of uh, the uh, input of uh, uh, something like uh, resource and environment costing input in agriculture and also reform the varietal certification systems. And then uh, the Chinese government published a document uh, for green agriculture and also uh, in the document they ask uh, the, the uh, they propose something like uh, green varieties, the notion of green varieties. That has, it's going to be realized by the uh, varietal certification systems in China and uh, published also last year and uh, with three principles. One is uh, green development and also the category of uh, varieties could be called green as superior quality. That's a separate independent uh, class of varieties to be certified. So we have made a standard for green super rice varieties. So how, uh, in our project, we want to neighbor some of our varieties to be green super rice varieties. Anyway, uh, that is uh, uh, in progress. And I hope by the end of this year, we could have a first few, uh, a batch of first few varieties. We could label them as green super rice varieties. And the second is something I'm going to propose as new, uh, going to uh, present new models of rice production, which is co-cultivation of rice and aqua aquatics. And also use Hubei as a case. And the, the one in the middle, that's a Hubei province, uh, which is where I'm located. And Hubei province ranked number one in aquaculture among all the provinces in China and it produces a lot of fish and a lot of, a lot of aquaculture uh, products. Ranked number five in rice production in China, and uh, last year, for example, produced uh, something like 70 million tons of uh, uh, paddy rice. So it's a province with thousand lakes and also known as a country of fish and rice uh, since ancient time. So uh, now, uh, in the last few years, there have been very rapid development in new models, something like crawfish, like frogfish, yeah, crawfish, fish, uh, rice, uh, uh, sorry, uh, crawfish, rice, uh, frog rice, uh, crab rice, 
uh, fish rice and duck rice, so many more. Uh, many models uh, developed and uh, uh, growing very rapidly in the last few years, for example, in uh, 2015, the area of co-culture reached uh, 1.5 million hectares in China, producing 1.5 million tons aqua, uh, aquatics, uh, aquaculture product. Actually, in Hubei province alone, so uh, 350,000 hectares of rice field adopted co-culture in last year, 2017. And the area uh, is still increasing very, very rapidly. So uh, crawfish rice accounted for 90%, 90% of the total increase for or the total area. So for example, in uh, uh, 2016, uh, the, uh, the uh, total value of crawfish is uh, 46 billion RMB, uh, creating 146 billion RMB in the whole chain. Uh, with an employment of five million people. That's a very, 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 very big uh, uh, business. So actually, uh, more than five, uh, more than a thousand cooperatives in rice, crawfish, agriculture, and also 20 of them operating at a scale of, uh, 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 that is 70 hectares. That's something like a thousand more in Chinese area unit. So crawfish, what is good about it, uh, actually is a, a mutual beneficial system. So crawfish could benefit rice. A rice straw provides a resting place for crawfish, and decayed rice straw provides somehow transformation of decayed rice straw could provide food uh, for, for, for crawfish. And rice field provides space for a healthy growth of, a growth of crawfish. And crawfish could also benefit rice. Uh, it generates need for retaining the straw to the field. And crawfish waste actually provide very good organic fertilizers uh, for rice. And uh, flooding the rice field in the winter time, especially, is our uh, proposal for grain because for green because the rice straw is uh, totally uh, digested by crawfish, and which also uh, kill the uh, overwinter insect. So existence of crawfish restrict the use of pesticide and fertilizers by the farmers. The farmers would do it without uh, asking. So it's actually it's a resource saving, environment friendly and ecologically balanced system. And then uh, my uh, notion for this system is called Shuang Sui, Shuang Sui in Chinese. And rice crawfish co-culture is one field, two product, one water, two usages. And uh, it produces green rice, green crawfish, and also at the same time, clean water. So two aquatics, double green. And then I wrote a paper in uh, Hubei Daily, and uh, it's a political sort of uh, declaration and remodel the country of fish and rice by Shuang Sui, Shuang Lui. And that was published only a few months ago. So actually, it's, uh, this sort of the industry is developing very, very rapidly. And uh, the third part of my talk is going to be my personal perspective. It's controversial, but it's my personal perspective. And people sitting here may not agree with me, but uh, I think uh, I would uh, do it anyway. So we have no problems in rice production in China. And I think the problem is overproduction. So uh, the very last uh, number you could remember is uh, something like 100 kg milled rice per person which is a bit too much for any population, not just Chinese population. So the problem is low price, difficult to sell, and little profit for the growers. So uh, new change and demands actually in a new time, but not actually new time, uh, but it's, uh, that's the case for many countries. So the functional foods are evolving, I should say, and it, uh, uh, it's a source of energy and nutrition, and also enjoyment, the food. It's not, just, uh, it's not just energy and nutrition, and it's also enjoyment. So diverse, diverse food uh, competing for the meal table is not, uh, so the concept of staple food is diminishing, uh, as we have been always talking about. Our first sentence, our paper, rice is a staple food for more than half of the world population, but that is diminishing. 
So the position of rice as a number one uh, staple, especially in China, is rapidly dec declining. So increasing attention to nutri nutrition and nutrients for healthy food and great concern with food security, that's a new trend. So if we want to talk about uh, healthy food, what should, we, what should that be? So uh, the Chinese Society of Nutrition has a guidelines for uh, Chinese populations on what to eat. What to eat, that is something we want to eat. So cereals and tubers account only for slightly more than a quarter of the total. And then uh, we have uh, many things we should, uh, we should uh, eat every day. So uh, again, that's recommended by the Chinese Society of Nutrition. We need minerals, recommended nutrient intake, and adequate intake, and vitamins also uh, needed. So anything, we don't need very much. Uh, we, we, we don't need more, we don't need less. So we need to have the uh, safety, the, 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 the uh, very, a very good level that is in the media. We call it safety intake uh, quantity, so healthy safety of nutrient intake. So uh, beyond that, uh, on both ends, that would uh, cause increased risk of uh, health. So uh, we check the uh, uh, rice varieties, uh, what in it. We have vitamins, of course. We have minerals also, and also we have problems. We have heavy metals. So heavy metals problems could be a problem in China and in our uh, rice consumption. So uh, the cause of heavy metals, number one is the application of fertilizers, especially nitrogen fertilizers, which could reduce uh, cause uh, acidification of the soil, especially in the south. So even though the, the soil is okay without the uh, excess amount of uh, uh, heavy metals, but uh, it still has problems that uh, produce more, uh, heavy, more uh, uh, heavy metals in the rice grain. So uh, varietal differences also, shen rice has higher uptake of uh, cadmium, for example, than green rice. So varietal differences should be also considered. Mining contamin contamination in certain area, but not all. So I think the number one cause is nitrogen applications. So reformation of agriculture system, that is uh, uh, something we have been uh, talking about in China very widely. We need, re need to reform the structure of agriculture, especially the supply side. And improving quality of the food, increase market values of the product, and evaluating, uh, elevating the profitability of the farmers. So that is our concern. We need to increase the income of the farmers. So what should we do? That's uh, my drawing of the value, how to increase the value of rice. And uh, the current, as of uh, now, and that is uh, we, the rice, uh, milled rice is sold at something on the average or below five yen per gene, Chinese unit, which is 500 grams. So if we, uh, we, we reduce the quantity, that could double the price. And then if we uh, keep it green, like what I have been proposing, that may, uh, may uh, increase its value to 15. And then we, if we uh, solve the safety problems, that could further increase. And palatability, uh, that could make uh, the rice grain to sell at 30 yen per, per gene. And then we could add nutrition, special palatability in combination with nutrition. And that could be sold at uh, 50 or more per gene, that's uh, our Chinese unit. So what is the solution? How are we going to do it? It's uh, green agriculture. We need green cultivars, we need green field management, we need green pest control. That is uh, what I said, uh, Shuang Sui, Shuang Lui is a way to go, at least in the area that is suitable for Shuang Sui, Shuang Lui. So food safety, we want uh, no residual pesticide, no heavy metal pollution, we want green cultivar, green field management, green pest control, green rice field also. So that is a guarantee for food safety. So palatability of rice, uh, green is the key. So what is the palatability? Actually, we have uh, people tasting this sort of things every day, and also we have machines, uh, uh, the meter to read the palatability. We have a palatability meter. 
And the key is that the palatability of a cooked rice is highly negatively correlated with protein content in the brain. So protein content is highly positively correlated with fertilizer application, especially a nitrogen fertilizer. So less fertilizer is a key for palatability. That's a that's is true with Xian rice or indica rice and also grain rice, uh, japonica rice. They are the same, so no exception. So you, you apply less uh, nitrogen fertilizer, it tastes much better. So breeding rice for human nutrition now we, is what we should do. So new nutrition set the basis for health and food is a source of nutrition. So crop breeding should take us goals to improve human nutrition. We need to improve the nutrition of food crops promoting to promote human health. So what we should do is toward nutrient rich and nutrition balanced rice. This is what we want to do. So examples, you know, golden rice. So uh, that is uh, one of the best examples for, for, uh, for nutrient enrichment. And also another which is less known is an example published in Nature Biotechnology 10 years ago, genetic engineered anthocyamine rich tomato boost health. How much? is an increase of lifespan by 28%. So if you want to be, uh, to live long, you could go back and eat purple tomatoes. Genetic engineered purple tomatoes may be the way to do it. So we could do rice. So we uh, engineered uh, Professor Yao Guang Niu's PPT. Uh, he engineered uh, by transformation of eight genes, he uh, sort of turned the white rice the white core rice into, uh, into black, which is uh, anthocyamine enriched. And uh, that is, uh, that's just an example of uh, how we should do it. There are many other nutrients we should pay attention also. So that is a road uh, coming back again, how are we going to increase the, 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 the value of, our, of uh, our rice product, especially uh, uh, the, the, the daily, daily uh, intake, uh, daily food. So uh, finally, I would like to offer my perspective. So the agriculture is undergoing unprecedented um, uh, transformation of rice agriculture and the industry in China and many other countries. So the way uh, that is displayed is the production models and the operation systems. It's uh, some sort of uh, models of cooperatives rather than individual farmers. So also we see a lot of diversification in recent years of consumer needs. So it's a value of uh, value, the view of value. What is the value of a rice grain, uh, rice sold in the market? That is not just for food, as I said, it's food, nutrition, and enjoyment. And also the taste, it's not the taste of the, the, the food itself, it's a taste of a, uh, the, the human view toward the world, and also the culture. So that is a product has a lot of, uh, has a lot of uh, uh, spirit in it. So our mission is a research and development of rice industry, not just for rice agriculture. So we should do more than just the varietal development. So we should develop new product to address consumer needs rather than just for varietal certification. And we should innovate new technologies and breed new varieties and we could we should create new models and pr promote new consumptions and need new type. So all those are new. So at the very uh, last, uh, I would like to thank my collaborators and uh, my team members. We just established the institute called Shuang Sui, Shuang Yu, and uh, aiming at uh, research and development uh, varieties very uh, suitable for the uh, uh, co-culture system and also breed for uh, crawfish or genetic based breeding for crawfish uh, to, to, for this industry. And finally, I would, like thank, I would like to thank you all for your attention.